for Connect Series, Leading the Digital Supply Chain. My name is Ira Sager. I'm Vice President of Global Learning Initiatives for the Center for Global Enterprise. This is the sixth and final session in our webinar series of Expert Connects on the Digital Supply Chain. Today we explore two vital topics, risk and competitive advantage, or one single topic. But we, before we start, uh, as some of you have joined us in the past, a few housekeeping notes. Today's session, as with all the sessions in this series, will be recorded and posted on the CGE YouTube channel. At the end of the presentation, we will have a slide with a link to the Digital Supply Chain Institute website for more information. Our, on our website, you will also find links to the previous Expert Connect webinars, and uh, each one is uh, linked and will take you to the CG YouTube channel so you can view the previous sessions. We'll leave approximately 15 minutes at the end of this session for audience questions. We'll also take questions during the presentation. So if you have a question for our presenters, at the bottom of the screen, you will see a Q&A feature. Please submit your questions using that function. We will try to get to all the questions, time permitting. As mentioned, today's Expert Connect is about risk and competitive advantage. The digital supply chain provides new, more sophisticated ways to manage risk by using technology and data to shift from a reactive mode to preventative control of risks. So in this session, <clears throat> we're going to explore how companies can mitigate risk more effectively, potentially turning risk into a competitive advantage. Leading our final Expert Connect in this series is Craig Moss, the director of CGE's Digital Supply Chain Institute and the Chief Operating Officer of the Center for Responsible Enterprise and Trade. And joining Craig is Dr. Dave Kurz, a research fellow for the Digital Supply Chain Institute and a clinical professor in the management department of Drexel University's LeBeau College of Business. And with that, I'll turn it over to Craig. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ira. Um, welcome, everybody. Really excited to have you join us for this uh, session. Uh, next slide, please. So as Ira mentioned, the learning objectives for today are really to help you to understand risk in the digital supply chain and what that entails. Two, we want to look at visibility as a very specific issue and around how you can use improved visibility to look at both performance and compliance of suppliers and reduce the risk there. We want to talk about shifting from reactive to proactive and the use of big data and analytics to accomplish that. And then one risk that clearly is, is escalating rapidly is around the uh, cybersecurity and the loss of intellectual property, whether it's trade secrets or confidential information. And finally, as, as Ira mentioned, we want to talk about how you can turn risk management into a competitive advantage and strategically how you would go about doing that. Next slide, please. So first, we're going to start off by looking at risk in the digital supply chain and give you a little background here. I want to start off and really define digital supply chain. Um, this came out of the original work that we did at the uh, Institute, a paper called The Front Side Flip, which if you haven't seen it, you might want to take a look at that. And we really looked at digital supply chain as being a customer centric platform that was using data and really focused on demand stimulation, which is unusual and kind of a new thought for supply chain. And also then how do you minimize risk in this as you're growing the supply chain and integrating it more into the marketing and sales of the organization, how do you start to mitigate risk more effectively? And that's what we'll be covering today. One of the things that we think about always at the Institute is we broke the, the framework that we use is really looking at demand, people, technology, and risk. And those are the four issues or, or buckets that we always think about. And all the work that we do, that's the context for it. Demand, people, technology, and risk. And through this series, you, we've had other uh, sessions on demand, people, and technology. And today we're going to zoom in and really take a careful look at risk. But in all the work, the customer really needs to be at the center of your thinking around this. So just to set the stage here, when we think about supply chain risks, I like to bucket it into two broad categories. So one is business performance risks. And clearly you can see here that these are the types of things that 
procurement departments typically are very focused on. You know, things like getting paid, of course, uh, making payments, uh, setting price, on-time delivery. These are all classic things that, uh, from a business performance standpoint, that supply chain people are very focused on and are a risk area. If you look at some of the natural disasters recently, huge disruption, huge issues with business continuity. But then increasingly, over the last 20 years, we have more and more compliance and regulatory risks. And these risks are really driving a lot of behavior in how companies are, are sourcing. And it really started, I think, probably about 25 years ago was the first big wave of, of uh, issues around labor compliance. And that started to come up and some of the companies in the apparel industry uh, were, were attacked for using uh, what were called sweatshops um, in different developing countries. So that's something that if over the years what's happened is that there's more and more regulation related to it. So now there's regulations in the US around human trafficking, around conflict minerals. All of these things drive behavior in the supply chain and create a new risk between the, the buyer and the supplier. Recently, as I mentioned before, the things that have really escalated now are things like data privacy, IP protection, and cybersecurity. Europe, with their general data privacy regulations, which went into law in May, um, has very, very stringent requirements around data protection and data privacy that not only is applicable to the, your company, but you're responsible for cascading some of this through your supply chain. That's another thing. If you think about this, IP protection, cybersecurity, no company is an island today. And every company has to think about the interrelationship between your organization and other organizations. And most of the regulations require you to cascade it in some fashion to the companies that you work with in your supply chain. Dave, anything you want to add to here? Yeah, well, I, Craig, I wanted to mention that uh, you know, it's interesting. We started off our conversation by talking about how you can gain performance improvements in your supply chain by having better understanding about customers, by focusing on customers. We, we, uh, we can achieve better forecasts. We can uh, uh, meet customer demands uh, more effectively by having increased uh, visibility and information into what customers are doing. But I think what you're also saying is that uh, there's been a rise in, uh, in some of these regulatory issues around the use of that customer data uh, that, uh, that we have to be aware of. So, uh, yeah, I was going to ask you about GD, that's GDPR is what uh, you were talking about, that general data protection. Uh, that is, is that that's a fairly recent uh, entry into the into the uh, regulatory arena, isn't that right? Yeah, absolutely. It was it's a, a European Union law. It was uh, approved about eighteen months ago, and then it went into effect uh, in May of this year. Yeah. So companies yeah. had a, a period of time to try to uh, prepare for it, but some of the things that it does is it one it requires an organization to. Um, give people the ability, especially consumers, the ability to erase all data that the company holds, mm -hmm. which from a technology standpoint is a very difficult task. Yeah. In many <laughs> as, as you replicate customer data across different analytics platforms, I imagine that you need to be able really? to trace all of that. That's, uh, yeah, that sounds like a challenge. Do you think companies are ready for this? Even, I mean, I guess they have to be, right? Yeah, there's been a big push. Uh, a lot of the major companies that we've talked with have made, been making a big push over the last 18 months to try to get ready for it. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how it goes. And the other thing it requires is an organization to actually have a, what we'll call a data privacy management system or mm -hmm. a set of controls internally that will help them to better manage and mitigate the risk. I think we can go on to the next slide. So there's some critical trends that make all of this more difficult for organizations. So starting at the top, there's more and more sensitive data and confidential data as assets. A lot of companies right now are calculating that probably 75 to 80% of their value as a corporation 
is in intangible assets and intellectual property. I was just last week working with a major manufacturer and they're, even though they're a manufacturer, they still count 80% of their value as being tied to IP. The next thing is expanding devices and access points. So, and this really goes next with the next one around dispersed personnel and third parties. If you think about working with, you might have hundreds or thousands of employees and contractors. You could have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of third parties you're working with. All of those are points in your, in your supply chain or your overall value chain that have sensitive data and confidential information from you. So that makes it harder and harder. There's more and more endpoints in each company's network or in their supply chain. The other thing that we see is disjointed responsibilities in companies. And I'm going to come back to this in a bit, but it really is, there are too many silos in companies. And that's one of the things where we think that the uh, risk mitigation and more effective risk management really entails breaking down silos and creating cross-functional teams. And I'm going to come back to that in, in a couple minutes. And then finally, as I mentioned before, there's a more and more complex regulatory environment. And so companies now, you might not think that you would be, the GDPR laws would be applicable to you, but they might be because you might be sharing information. You might be a U.S. company, but your information is being shared with a supplier in Europe that is covered under those laws. So you would actually be liable for that. And the other thing that overrides risk on the compliance and regulatory side is that most in almost all the categories we talked about, you are liable for the actions of third parties. So if we think about corruption risk, for example, most of the cases brought to court and most of the criminal and civil or, uh, civil cases involve third party actions. So that's another thing to keep in mind is the, the liability that you have for the third parties in your network and what they do. Hey, hey Craig, quick question. Uh, I was just thinking when you may, had that example of a company that you maybe didn't even know was domiciled or had a nexus in another country, uh, are, is there a reliable source of information about the domain uh, I guess drivers for the different uh, partners that we engage with we have a value chain uh, how would we know exactly what the the uh, legal nexus or domain of a of a value chain partner would be to make sure that we're not uh, inadvertently getting ourselves into an out of compliance situation it's it's a challenge Dave and one of the things that that companies that we've talked to through the the institute often tell us is visibility is one of the things that they really struggle with. So not only the visibility of your direct suppliers, but then the tier two or tier three. And so it really is a challenge is, and one of the things where I think that uh, enhanced technology helps is to increase visibility. Mm -hmm. But it, it's a very, very difficult thing. I mean, if you think about like, do you know where your data is stored? If you go in and ask a lot of different companies that, do you know where your data is stored? Um, many, many companies have no idea. They know it's in the cloud someplace, but they don't know where exactly. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, uh, uh, maybe that's part of what cloud services need, needs to uh, adapt to, is to be able to identify some kind of uh, residency of where this, uh, this information is stored. Absolutely. And, and certain, some countries now are putting in laws related to that, is that, that they want the data to be stored in their country. Mm, interesting. Wow. You can go to the next slide. So just, just the basics on risk management. <clears throat> I'm sure to many of you this is very familiar, but really the whole process of risk management is to identify the risks, to assess how serious they would be. And in the assessment, typically you want to look at the likelihood or probability of it happening and then how serious the impact would be. So if you balance those two, you could find some risks that are very, very likely to happen, but would have a low impact. In other cases, there could be risks that would be very rare occurrence, but would be a total fiasco. 
So if we think about it from a health and safety standpoint, for example, having a huge explosion at a chemical plant is probably a very low likelihood, but the negative impact is absolutely enormous. Other things there, somebody slipping and falling and you know, spraining their ankle or breaking their wrist is probably very likely to happen over the course of a year, but the impact other than to the individual is relatively minor. And even to the individual, it's a minor thing. So in all of the risk categories, that's the way that we think you should be thinking about it. And this sort of classic enterprise risk management, likelihood and negative impact. And then from there to prioritize those, and then to think about how are we gonna manage these risks? So what controls are we gonna put in place? What kind of systems are we gonna put in place to either reduce the likelihood of it occurring or to reduce the negative impact if it does occur? Uh, Craig, quick, uh, quick comment. So uh, the, looking at this assess piece in the, in the middle, I was having a conversation with a doctoral student recently who's doing some research on uh, this, uh, the likelihood of an organization taking proactive measures to prevent cyber uh, risk or pre prevent cyber breach, I guess. Uh, and one of the things that was shocking uh, is in listening to her, some of her early research is that uh, there are so many examples that she was able to find of companies that just let certain breaches go because the dollar impact of them was so small. I mean, relatively small. I mean, uh, for, small for some companies might be $100,000, you know? Right. That sounds like a lot, but um, I'm curious uh, on, for your take on this. I thought of you immediately when she talked about this. Um, is, is, this is this common, do you think, that uh, there are many breaches that are occurring that just are that they don't achieve this, the threshold of cost for taking action and, and organizations are letting them go? I, I would think that that's accurate. Um, and the reason for that is a couple of fold. One is if you start to, if you publicize every breach, right. um, one, you're going to become more of a target. Yeah. Then other people are going to say, well, so-and-so got in there or people are getting in there. I'm going to try to get in there too. Um, the other thing is you think about reputational damage from that. So I think in some cases, because any company that reports a large breach suffers reputational damage. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you look at uh, Equifax, you look at Target when it happened to them. Um, and, and so it really is something that, that it would not be surprising at all. Were, were you going to mention the, the source of the Target breach? I thought that was a fascinating story. Yeah, for any of you that are not familiar with it, the, the target breach occurred through one of their HVAC vendors. So the hackers went into the vendors, uh, the HVAC company's system, and through that, because the HVAC company was tied into the target uh, uh, systems, was able to penetrate the target system through there. Wow. The other thing that, I mean, for, for people that are maybe not that familiar with this is that on average, hackers are inside a network for eight months before they're discovered. Because that's what they want to do is they want to penetrate the network and then stay in, in stealth mode as long as possible to move around and see how far they can get and what information they can gather <clears throat> before, before the actual breach comes when, they, when somebody would notice that they were there. So you think about somebody breaking into your house and being in your house for eight months, going from closet to closet and drawer to drawer, they don't want you to know they're there until they figure out where all the good stuff is, and then they're going to grab it and run, and then they don't care if they know if you know they're there. So you can go to the next slide. So I want to throw a question out to the group now as to where do you stand in this? And if we think about risk management, where do you stand? Next slide. What we found in a survey that we did recently, when we asked the question, where is your transformation to a digital supply chain furthest ahead and furthest behind? 64% said they were furthest behind on risk. So we'll use that as a context setter for the next slide. 
And I want each of you to think this through. And if you want, you could send in a chat with, with where you are. That might be interesting. Send in a chat to Dave or a question to uh, Dave and, and Ira about where you are. But the following best describes how we manage supply chain risks. So the first one, we're primarily reactive and address problems in our supply chain as they arise. That clearly is an, is an older way to do it. A lot of companies are still there. Next would be companies that have established a program to address the more common risks, and they're starting to think about how to utilize data and technology to improve efficiency. A lot of even leading companies, this is where we see them being, is more in this middle uh, level of maturity. And then finally would be where the last point, we use data analytics to seek patterns in our risks and adjust our risk management to reduce or prevent recurrence. So that really is that whole preventative and proactive approach to risk management. Not many companies are here yet, but I think that this is a goal for what companies should be seeking to do. Dave, any, any comments from you on this one? Well, I think when I look at a maturity model like this that you're sharing, I, I think in terms of, uh, you know, kind of a stage one, phase one, and then, you know, an, another horizon maybe where we're trying to improve our situation and maybe there's some future state where we have uh, a really satisfactory uh, kind of risk management program. Um, so I guess just from your experience, Craig, uh, when you see companies that are in that, that first stage, that reactive mode, uh, but they, you know, they start, uh, they, they, they have a, a desire to move to a more sophisticated uh, kind of mode. How long does it typically take? Is this a, a, a matter of months? Is this a matter of years? Uh, just to set expectations for, you know, what, what does uh, good really look like? Uh, and uh, how long does it take to get there for uh, just on average? Well, you know, one of the things that we uh, advocate with companies and, and the, at the Digital Supply Chain Institute, we actually have a transformation accelerator program that anybody who's interested could get in touch with us about. But what we advocate if, when you're making that transformation from the first level to the second level of maturity is not to uh, tackle everything at once. All right. But pick, pick certain risk areas in that. So say, and, and typically what we see is on the compliance and regulatory side, companies are further ahead on labor, environment, and health and safety uh, because they've been dealing with those things for much longer. So they tend to have relatively uh, strong or, or mid-level maturity programs in those. We see companies are relatively at an infancy stage on uh, cyber and uh, IP protection in particular are two areas where we see a lot of weakness. So we would, we would encourage them to pick some things and then start to use data and see how can we improve the efficiency of managing that risk, whether it's a business performance risk related to like business continuity or something to do with delivery or demand matching and the risk associated with not matching demand or a compliance risk is to pick something and focus on it, start to pull the data in there and use that as a stepping stone or a building block to uh, uh, go to the next level. All right. so be strategic about which areas you're investing in uh, for the ones that have the highest risk uh, and uh, you can manage uh, manage according to that plan. It's almost like a, a strategic plan of how to uh, uh, develop a risk management uh, strategy. Yeah, very much so. And and you know the sophisticated companies that we work with are, are really trying to integrate supply chain risk into the overall enterprise risk management mm -hmm. framework. So uh, next slide. Yeah, are are supply chains behind relative to some of the other areas in organizations when it comes to risk? That's a good question. Um, if you look at some of the risks, like a health and safety risk, there's really an internal risk, you know, it happening in your own facilities or the risk of it happening in a third party. In that case, most companies are much farther ahead in managing it internally. And I think the same with cyber. Um, they're much further ahead at managing it internally than they would be in helping to manage it or managing it in their supply chain. But I think supply chain is inherently an interconnected discipline. Um, so I think that it's really kind of, there's some unique challenges there that they face. 
Uh, Craig, we've got a question coming in from Elizabeth, uh, who is asking about uh, if you see certain industries being more uh, risk. Uh, how, it says, uh, how, how do you have a, a certain industries that are more uh, open to risk or have, have more risk associated with them from a cyber perspective? Uh, yeah, I mean, b banking is, is clearly the, one of the top ones from a cyber perspective. Uh, and uh, the credit card companies are another one that, that will get targeted quite a bit. And increasingly, other companies that have types of intellectual property. So you might have heard about the, like the Sony breach. Um, you think about a company that, uh, like a, a, that is really built on, on uh, intellectual property. Um, and, and people are increasingly trying to go at that and get at that intellectual property. So I was working with a manufacturer, um, very uh, high tech type of items and people try to get at that intellectual, you know, the trade secrets that they have. So I think banking would be number one mm -hmm. comes to mind. And then from there is companies or industries where there's a uh, high value intellectual property that's in digital form. Ah, right, right. Thanks for that question. By the way, others, if you have questions, you want to pepper those in, just use that Q&A uh, window at the bottom of your screen and uh, start uh, tossing some over for Craig. That'd be great. And Elizabeth, if I didn't answer your question sufficiently, if anybody asks a question and I don't answer it sufficiently or you have a follow-up question, just, you know, pop it in uh, and we'll uh, take care of it on the spot. So, Dave, you mentioned this before, what does good look like in risk? So what we think good is going to look like is using data to reduce the business performance and client and compliance risk through predictive analytics to be able to predict instead of react. A special focus on cyber and protection of confidential information. That's really going to become more and more important. And if you think about some of the technological trends, like think about 3D printing. Okay, so suddenly when 3D printing becomes bigger and bigger, if somebody can get a hold of your digital files that you're using to produce product through 3D printing, they then can produce an identical product to you. Think about that. I mean, the impact of that and the need to protect your information is just going to accelerate through just the one application of 3D printing. And if we think through, there's other situations like that that come up. The other thing is we want you to encourage you to strategically segment risks. And I'll end the conversation today with this is where do you want to manage them? And where do you want to excel to become a world leader in managing that risk and gaining a competitive advantage? And that I'm going to come to a bit later and I'll give you some specific examples. And then finally, um, we have put together some digital supply chain essential risk metrics. So if you have any interest in that, um, we can make that available to you also. Some of the things that we think companies may want to consider measuring in this new digital world uh, from a risk standpoint. Dave, anything on this before we go to the next topic? Uh, yeah, just uh, one thing came, came up, came to mind, which is uh, in a global environment, a global uh, playing field, uh, are there certain countries where where this IP risk is greater than others? You know, so if I'm looking to move into a certain part or region of the world, uh, are there uh, are there additional risks associated with certain regions around, especially intellectual property? Yeah, clearly there are, um, and you have to look. One, you have to look at the the laws that each country would have, and then you have to look at the enforcement of the law in that country. Um, and then in other cases, certain countries would require for you to invest in that country or to set up a joint venture in that country, you could be obligated to transfer uh, some of your intellectual property to that, to that country or to the wow. local joint venture partner. How about that? So, yeah, it's something that is, is very, it's not all countries are not the same in terms of IP risk or other risks. I mean, if you look at corruption risk, there it's more a case where the laws are becoming more uniform globally, but the enforcement of the laws is really, really inconsistent in many countries. 
Is there a good source of information to find out? Uh, so let's say I'm developing a, a globalization, global expansion strategy, and I need to start thinking about these issues. Uh, is there a reliable source of information about uh, some of the, the aspects or dimensions you talked about with different uh, regions, different countries? I, I mean, I think you would have to do it topic by topic. Yeah, you know, it, it, you'd really like the the International Labor Organization, uh, the ILO, has good stuff on labor compliance risk. Um, there's uh, indexes of of corruption risk that are available, but I don't think there's any one place that where you could go and say what's the risk for of IP protection or cyber or corruption or right. all the other compliance risks. So it, it would take some really digging, but yeah. certainly you could assemble it for any individual country. Gotcha. Let's go to the next slide. So we're going to talk now a little bit about big data and some ways to start to shift to a more proactive uh, approach to this. Next slide. <clears throat> so one of the things when we were asking companies, this is a survey from last year <clears throat> of about 140 companies. When you're tracking your transformation, what are some of the things that you're gonna be looking at from a risk and, and some of the, these are three of the top, these were the top three things. So if we look, one is they were, they're looking to track, are they getting greater visibility? Two was the speed of sensing or meeting customer demands, which is really a demand related issue. But the next one was use of predictive analytics to reduce risk. So two of the top three things that people wanted to track and work on are really risk related. Uh, getting that visibility is critical. The visibility, visibility helps a lot, both from a risk management standpoint, but also it does help you become more efficient in meeting demand. Um, so I think that really goes both ways. But <clears throat> predictive analytics is something that we hear a lot from companies, is how do you start to do that what do you start to do to put that together and put that in place? Greg, I wonder if I could just interject and ask you a question. Do you, can you cite any examples of companies that you think are moving in the right direction in terms of using predictive analytics to reduce risk? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I, I don't like to mention company names in, in a lot of these cases, but I can mention specific um, examples. So for example, here, if you think about it from a, a product failure risk standpoint, there are companies that are doing it in the technology industry and in the aerospace industry. For quite a while, they've been using um, predictive analytics to determine when a part is gonna fail. So that's an example that's been around for quite a while. And it's, now we see companies starting to take that mentality and extend it to new areas. Uh, Craig, I just want to add one quick thing because when you mentioned predictive analytics, my ears perk up. And uh, uh, w one of the uh, really interesting aspects of this whole big, big data and analytics thrust that you see that it's been going on for a while. It's not, it's not brand new, but our sophistication, our sophistication, our ability to execute on analytics strategy is getting better and better as technology is, uh, is speeding up and allowing us to access pools of information and data that aren't necessarily right uh, in our own servers. Uh, you know, so I just wanted to mention that, that uh, to, to get better predictive information or to create it, uh, it requires the, not only the transactional data that you have right in your, in your own uh, information, your, your, your structured data, but it's also bringing in new sources of information, unstructured information. Uh, you know, so we, we hear supply chain leaders talking about bringing in telemetric uh, information. Uh, the weather information is very critical you know, in sort of uh, being able to sense where there could be potential supply disruptions. Uh, and, and it's the ability to capture that unstructured information out in, uh, in the world and bring it into, uh, compare it with what you're doing in your supply chain and to be able to identify where there could be uh, areas to uh, flag, uh, identify where there could be a, a predictive issue that you need to address. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. 
Uh, next slide, please. So here are a couple of quick ideas on how do you start to, to do this and shift from reactive to proactive. So one of the things that we see is the need for cross-functional collaboration to break down silos. We see in companies that data in many cases is still very siloed in companies. Supply chain might have their system, sales and marketing has theirs, <clears throat> product development might have a separate, finance has a separate system, and all this data even internally is siloed. So one of the things is how do you get the people, the different departments together to collaborate and start to share internally. So that's, that's one of the first things that we see. And in some of the work we're doing now is we're looking at ways to form teams around rapid problem solving. Um, so that's, that's the first. Next is, is looking at increasing the visibility into direct suppliers. And we see this as a, something that companies are really looking at. And looking at it in terms of when I say visibility into, you may, could be visibility into the labor practices in a supplier. It could be visibility into the production capacity utilization of a supplier. Because if you look at it from a risk standpoint, one of the, the root causes of a lot of problems, business performance as well as compliance, is factories will take on more orders than they can produce. And when they go over capacity like that, they tend to use unauthorized subcontractors. And we see this globally as a really, really big recurring problem. So once you get into the use of unauthorized subcontractors, what happens there? Think about it from a IP protection. Suddenly you might be thinking I'm dealing with Dave, but Dave has, without my knowledge, subcontracted Ira to do the work. Dave's giving Ira all the stuff I gave Dave. I thought Dave was going to protect it, but now I've got to, I don't even know Ira exists. So this visibility is absolutely critical. The next step would be gaining visibility beyond tier one. We think blockchain, this is a potential good use case for blockchain, is this enhanced visibility. And we're running some pilots now on the use of blockchain in this. So that's something we would encourage you to be thinking about is the utilization of blockchain to increase visibility and to get a little bit more accurate and uh, information information that you can trust. Next would be to utilize, and Dave mentioned this, and integrate new data sources. You know, unstructured data, social media data. Um, picking up social media data in a country can give you a lot of indications about what's going on there that could be causing you potential problems down the road. So for example, you know, around things like uh, uh, local incidents of, of uh, uh, of uh, cyber problems or things like that, local weather patterns, things like that, is to get those new data sources. And then finally, to start to think about building algorithms to predict the likelihood of future events. And we're doing work also on algorithms and developing algorithm councils as a mechanism to force this cross-functional collaboration. So these would be some of the key things from a digital supply chain standpoint that we think are some of the, 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 the basics of moving from a reactive to a proactive approach. Hey, Craig, can I add a couple things? So uh, one of the really good examples I can think of uh, when it comes to social media information, giving insights that could be useful from a supply chain perspective uh, is the area around warranty claims. Uh, so, you know, traditionally warranty claims have been handled uh, when, when a customer actually contacts uh, you to let you know that they've got a problem uh, with the product that you have uh, been selling them. And if you think about something gets into the supply chain, gets out to customer, gets into a use situation and then develops a problem, that's, we're talking months and months of, of time uh, to find out that there could have been a manufacturing problem. Uh, with social media analysis, some companies are getting very good at this now where they're scraping that social media information and any mention of a, of a product where there is some sort of issue that is reported, like, uh, you know, on my keyboard is sticking uh, on uh, my W key. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, you know, they're, they're able to get out in front of some of those warranty issues by, by analyzing that unstructured social media data, pulling it in, and then flagging if there are multiple instances of mention of uh, certain warranty issues, they can get out uh, and, uh, and identify those sometimes months before uh, you could have uh, you know, with traditional techniques. Um, so that was one, one uh, mention. The other is uh, this algorithm idea is really fascinating. And uh, you know, there's, there's building algorithms. And there's also this idea of machine learning algorithms that you know, if you're able to create you know, pools of data, they call them data lakes now, uh, where you can find patterns. You can set a machine learning process, uh, uh, you know, start one off on that data lake to try to find uh, patterns, to, find, uh, to be able to predict where you might be able to uh, have uh, an issue. I think that's, uh, that, that's one thing. Uh, Gregory does have a question here, Craig, also. Uh, basically, he's trying to figure out which industries are the most developed, which was Iris' question. Uh, and then uh, he's also interested in, in which industries are least are behind or maybe in a different f uh, uh, phase uh, and have uh, benefited from digital for construction, for instance, is, a, is very uh, behind uh, relative to others. Uh, any thoughts on, on Gregory's question? Is, is it related to uh, cybersecurity and IP protection specifically or more broadly? Uh, it seems like it's more broadly. If that's okay. not correct, Gregory, shoot me a, a another Q and A to clarify. Yeah, on a broader sense, that's a wow. That's a hard question. Which industries are behind? Maybe take it from the cybersecurity IP perspective. I think that's the context that we were in earlier. Yeah, from a cyber standpoint, um, <clears throat> God, a lot of industries are way behind. Uh, manufacturing is pretty far behind as an overall sector. Um, critical infrastructure, manufacturers that are in the critical infrastructure are a little bit further ahead. Um, the U.S. government is pushing companies that are supplying the U.S. government to become more cyber secure. Um, but so many sectors are, are behind. Um, I would say food is, and consumer products are pretty far behind is one that comes to mind in particular. Yeah, and that's a risky one, right? You've got any type type of food product that has food safety issues. You really need to be able to track and trace uh, the source of the uh, of the supply. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So now we're actually going to talk a little bit about cyber and IP risks. Um, this is a topic that I I talk a lot about and do a lot of uh, sessions on this. So I've put together something relatively brief, but if people are interested, we can certainly uh, find ways to follow up with you. So there's really three pillars of IP protection. One would be management systems. And this is the one that most people don't really think about. And that, when I say management system, I'm talking about trained, committed people that are following the procedures. It's not about having a policy. It's about, are people doing this? Two would be legal, and that's where a lot of it has always occurred was through contracts and litigation. The lawyers in the company would, would get a contract sign, sign saying, this is our intellectual property. We're giving it to you to produce a million units of our product, period, the end. And then if they found you know, that it wasn't being followed, they would try to litigate in some capacity. And then three is IT and physical security. And of course, IT security is more and more important as more of the assets are digital. So that's something that is really important to keep in mind. Management systems is the piece that companies are typically weakest at in terms of overall IP protection. And that is really thinking about the people and process and how do you get people to follow it? So <clears throat> um, that's something that we could talk a lot about, but I don't think we have time to talk that much about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talked about training last, uh, last week and, uh, you know, just the uh, people becoming data citizens is what our guest from J&J &J mentioned. It was a great concept, you know, increasing sensitivity about uh, how data is used and making sure it's protected. And then also within organizations uh, need to know. That's one of the things that's really, really important for organizations to think about is, is that need to know who really needs to know this information. 
So what's today's situation? So one is, and I'm now focused on IP protection and cyber. Organizations are pretty weak at the risk assessment piece. And they, ha they don't really know where the assets are. They haven't really prioritized what the most important assets are to protect. Um, and it's a struggle for companies. So if you don't know what is most important to protect, it's really hard to protect everything equally well. And that creates a big problem. The other thing that I mentioned before is silos still dominate. And trade secret protection or confidential information protection is still primarily viewed as a legal issue. Cyber is still primarily viewed as an IT issue. It's starting to change, but it's just at the beginning of that change. And then that cross-functional approach, more people realize it's essential, but it's not really consistently employed. We do see a trend. I'm working with a group of 25 multinationals um, to talk to them about cyber and what their approaches are. And we do see a trend toward legal, IT, and compliance forming a three-department collaboration around trying to improve cybersecurity and trade secret protection, legal, compliance, and IT. So that's a big step in the right direction. Um, a lot of companies really grapple with the idea of what are, is appropriate level of controls for a third party to have or for us to have. And we there advocate the idea of <clears throat> a depth and breadth approach. So where are the critical assets or critical suppliers that you're dealing with that you want to go in depth and really have a good understanding of what's going on. But then how do you cover the broad spectrum? If you have 10,000 suppliers, you can't go in depth with everybody. So you have to have a strategic way to understand depth versus breadth. Yeah, and, that, and that's where uh, the, the uh, good analytics strategy can really help. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. That you have to pull that data together. Right. And then, uh, the, Sorry, Craig, we got an interesting question here. Uh, sorry, why, why don't you finish what you're about to say and then I'll, I'll pop the question, sorry sure. about that. Sure, and then the other thing is that third party risks are high and engagement is low around this. And it's still, we still see a lot of companies looking at this contractual approach to trying to protect uh, digital assets. And there's really a lack of in monitoring to ensure if the obligations are being met. I'll tell you, we're doing some <clears throat> work now with we're looking at a multinational that has 60 uh, supply chain partners around the world. And what we found is that all 60 signed a contract that had certain obligations around cybersecurity and protection of trade secrets. They all signed it. Zero had the capability to meet the contractual obligations. Wow. <laughs> so if you think about that, think in each of your companies, are the contracts one, is it being covered in the contract? But then two, does the third party have the capability to deliver on that? And most people are just focused on the business side of it. So, but somebody does need to be thinking about this. They say they're going to protect our trade secrets. How are they going to do it? So on, on to the question then, Dave. Yeah, so uh, Stenbergen has an interesting question. Uh, I think we'll expand it just a little bit, if that's okay, Stenbergen. It, he's asking, um, please expand more on the role of the Algorithm Council in, in helping companies. And I guess I would just add, uh, in, de in developing algorithmic solutions to help manage risk, I think uh, would be the right context. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Stenbergen, on that. But uh, So uh, I don't know if we mentioned Algorithm Council yet, but maybe, Craig, yeah, maybe, maybe. describe that a little bit and then how, what, what its role might be in helping mm -hmm. establish uh, some good uh, practices around uh, risk management. Sure, yeah, we did mention it a little bit earlier. So what we're, what we're doing with the Algorithm Council is looking at forming a cross-functional team of senior people that starts to identify common business problems, the most common pressing business problems from each department's perspective. So you could have supply chain and finance and sales and marketing and product development and HR coming together. And they then collectively are going to identify those common pressing problems that they share. From there would be to start to look at either building or adapting algorithms 
identifying what data sources, like in a, in a greenfield situation, what data sources would you want to be able to get at to really be able to solve this problem and get all the different perspectives of it. That council then would be something that would meet on a routine basis to look at the performance of the algorithms, how the machine learning is possibly adapting the algorithms and what the results are, and then start to either, one is sustain those first ones that have been built, but then also to continually identify the new most pressing problems that are common to the different functional departments. Yeah, and Gregory has a follow-up uh, to that, I think that fits right in here. Uh, so he mentions that silos hold back innovation, and then the question is around, you know, what type of organizational structures can be deployed to help break down silos? Uh, I think that that's a kind of a cue for algorithm council in a way, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, the way that I would look at it is, um, or the way that I, I typically look at it, and I've worked with hundreds of companies on this basis, is we don't get as involved in thinking about how they need to change their org structure. Right. We get involved in thinking about what short-term project with a definable goal would naturally break down the silos and pull people together to solve a very specific goal and then kind of let it organically go from there. So instead of coming in and saying, you need to change the org structure, we would say, what is the common problem that these departments have? Of course, you got to get them in the room in the first place, but what are we going to solve in six months or three months? What's really pressing? And then what we find is that the, the org structure, the collaboration, the process improvement all takes place organically underneath the people trying to meet a, a challenging goal. So let's go to the next slide. We're getting close to the end of our time. What companies are trying to get to with cyber and IP protection is verified trust. So that's really the key thing for you to think about is you do need to be able to trust your suppliers but how do you verify it? Because what we've seen historically is that relying only on self-assessment or self-certification is not really sufficient. So you do have to have some way to, in a scalable fashion, to try to get to a verified trust. So again, it gets back to identify and prioritize what you want to protect. Map the critical data dependent interdependencies. So again, but like that target case was a case where it was a supplier that was used as a gateway into the target system. Somebody needs to be mapping where are the access points and how could things get in and also what data are we sharing or sending out to people. Um, we mentioned before about uh, integrating cyber and IP into supplier selection. So we think that that is something we see it happening more and more. We think that that's going to be an ongoing trend, and we think that companies will be able to develop a competitive advantage through being better at cyber and IP protection in, the, uh, in, in getting business and gaining investment. Go beyond the contract, we've talked about that, and really start to think about how you could assess the maturity of the third parties. What controls do they have in place? Collaboration with a purpose we talk about is you really need to be able to collaborate with those third parties in a mutually beneficial way. And one of the things that we're looking at, I'm writing some work with Dave on accelerating transformation. And one of the things we're looking at there is the idea of trading data. Like I will give you this data that you want of mine if I can get this data from you. So that's one of the things that we're looking at is how would you do that and in a way, in sort of a systematic way. And then finally, I mentioned before the depth and breadth approach. Next slide. So we're now getting to the end. And what I want to just do is, and then we have a, I, there've been some good questions along the way, but I do want to leave a few minutes. Um, next slide. Is think about turning risk into an opportunity. If you, you can become ex excellent at something, if you become excellent at managing a certain type of risk, it is a competitive advantage. Next slide. And so what I challenge each company to do is to make a strategic decision. And if you look at that broad spectrum of the risks, both the business performance or the compliance risks, 
what could you turn into a strategic advantage, a, a competitive advantage? So think about if you're a credit card company, if I'm MasterCard or Visa or Amex, and I become known as the world leader in protecting personal information, that gives me a strategic advantage as a credit card company. If I become, they wouldn't care about being a world leader in environmental protection. It's not part of their core business. If I'm Patagonia or Timberland or North Face, and I become known as a world leader in environmental protection in the supply chain, that gives me a competitive advantage because that's core to my brand value. So what I challenge each company to do is to think about your company, think about your customer base, think about the risks and where do you want to mitigate and have an acceptable level of risk management. And where's that one thing that you want to be world-class and be known as the best. It could be on-time delivery, it could, whatever it is, we really, really advocate that you think about risk as an opportunity, risk management as an opportunity, and not just a cost center. Any other questions coming in? Yeah, so pe pepper those questions in if you have any. Uh, and uh, Craig, I just, while we're uh, looking for those questions, uh, I just wanted to mention that it strikes me that this transparency of information trading that's going on with uh, value chain partners, uh, it resembles a negotiation, uh, doesn't it? I mean, you're, you're really, you're sitting down at the table, you know, metaphorically, and you're, you're saying, uh, th this, is, this is a vision of what a transparent sharing of information would look like. You're, you're sharing this, we're sharing this. Right. And uh, it's, uh, it reminds me of the negotiator's dilemma a little bit, though. You know, if you share, but the trading partner doesn't share back, then you've just given away uh, right. some, uh, some value and uh, you've weakened your negotiating position. So it really does have to be a kind of a mutual gains discussion. Uh, with these value chain partners. So I see a question just came in around what we talked about management systems for or and con, types of controls. And, and could I go into a little more detail? So what we look at there is if you think about and it's really common around all the risk areas, there's usually seven or eight different building blocks. So the first one would be the idea of policies and procedures. Next would be having that cross-functional team or who's really managing that part of the risk program. The next one would be the risk assessment piece, which we've talked about a lot. Next would be third-party management, which is really a critical piece. Next would be training and capacity building. So do you have a training program? You can have the best policy in the world, but if there's no awareness of it, it's really not gonna work. The next piece is monitoring. That's something that we see on a global basis as being the weakest area, except in a few isolated cases where monitoring has really become a huge industry, like labor compliance monitoring is now a multi-billion dollar industry. And they're pretty good at the monitoring piece. And then the final piece is corrective actions. So that, that's uh, sort of the building blocks. Ira, I guess back over to you to uh, do the wrap up. Yeah, before I wrap up, Craig, I just want to follow up and you, you kind of you listed a great um, explanation of risk and uh, turning it into a competitive advantage. If I'm listening to this and I'm a supply chain manager and I want to start implementing some of this, where, where would you suggest I start? Maybe to get some good uh, examples that I can show management uh, that this is something we need to proceed with and broaden. Yeah, that's, that's a Really a good question. Um, you mean in terms of like where other companies have done it, like case studies that somebody might be able to get? Yeah, either case studies or just from your own experience. Where you think you know this is low hanging fruit? If you want to go to your manager and say this is a this is a, what we need to do, and I want to prove to you that we can have success embracing this strategy. Here's where I want to start. Yeah, so I, I think what I, what I always would think about is getting that one key statistic that would really highlight it. So Gartner did a study recently, and they said that by, I think the stat was by 2020, 60% of companies will be assessing the cybersecurity 
and IP protection capability of any supplier before they sign a contract. So that's the kind of thing that would get management attention in the, in the beginning and then kind of go from there. Uh, great, thank you. And now that we're a little bit over on our time, I wanna thank Craig and Dave, uh, great presentation. I wanna thank the audience again uh, for uh, following us through the series on the digital supply chain. Uh, and uh, I wanna remind you too that you can capture, or not capture, we've captured it for you, but you can see all the previous uh, recorded uh, Expert Connects on this topic. If you go to the DSCI website, uh, we have it all there, uh, easy link for you. And I also want to put in a plug for another Expert Connect series that we are launching uh, tomorrow, in fact, at 10 a.m. And this one is on digital identity. This will also be a series recurring and it'll go monthly as of September. But tomorrow's uh, <laughs> Digital Identity uh, Expert Connect will focus on an introduction to the topic, which uh, is another interesting and, and part of, I think, what we've been discussing in digital transformation, because we're all used to identity in an analog world. And as we move to a digital world, the challenges are enormous. And it's not just management from a business perspective. There are lots of societal issues, and we hope in this series to begin to delve into that. Again, I want to thank everyone and have a good rest of the day. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.